Hello, my name's George McPherson, part-time farmer, part-time farming journalist. Everyone keeps telling us we've got to change. The question is, how? Well, we thought it would be a good idea to consider how we've changed already, from using equipment like this to equipment like this. It really is quite amazing. We start in 1939, because one farmer, the late Frederick Heinherd, was very keen on using his cine camera. And he recorded on film as many of the farming operations as he could as he went through the seasons. His farm was on the outskirts of Seven Oaks in Kent. And his film provides us with a fascinating reminder of what things were like. We're also going to meet two generations of Suffolk farming family. Harold Cooper and his nephew, Oliver. We're going to compare notes with them, see how their memories compare, and see what they have in mind for the future. Watching these old film clips from 1939 reminds me what it was like during World War II. At that time, everyone wanted as much farm produce as they could possibly get hold of, because Britain simply couldn't import enough. What a difference from today government more or less took over control of farming. And they've never really let go since, except that government now includes Brussels. During the next hour or so, we're going to compare farming then with farming today. Before we speak to farming observer Peter Hollinshead, we're going to ask him how he thinks things could change over the next 60 years. In these old clips, I expect you, like me, will be pretty surprised at just how many people worked on farms. Seeing our parents and grandparents providing the motive power for machines like potato riddlers or even planters is absolutely fantastic now. I mean, we just wouldn't dream of such things. And the sheer hard labor of it all. Well, here we go with Acres of Change. Ainsford Farm, West Kent, the year 1939, a time of great change in British agriculture. The old ways of farming were fast disappearing as a new mechanised age chugged forward. During that year, Frederick Heinard filmed every activity on his farm, leaving us with this unique detailed record of the transition from horsepower to tractors. <laughs> Mr. Heinard farmed 330 acres, a few miles from Sevenoaks, and only 20 miles from central London. He was well aware of the new revolution in farming, and took great care to record the old methods in some detail. His one-way single furrow plough had probably already finished its working life, but having an experienced ploughman on the farm made it worthwhile demonstrating to the camera. The farm was already equipped with five modern tractors. The real ploughing was done with a ransom two-furrow plough pulled by a case tractor. Mr. Heinard was no romantic when it came to the economics of farming. He was thoroughly practical, using modern machinery for heavy work, but still using his horses and their old equipment for slower, lighter jobs. He liked to compare the old and the new and frequently found that the horse was still economic for many jobs on a labour-intensive farm. Just before the war, a dozen men were employed full-time. In the spring of the year, as soon as the soil was warm and dry enough, there was a rush to prepare the ground for drilling. 
the old 13-row drill pulled by two horses was still quite as cost-effective as anything newer. There were still more horses on the farm than tractors, so all the men could be busy at the same time. Those without horses were sent to drill cabbage and savoy seeds using the oldest energy source of all. Chemical weed control in cereals was still very primitive too. The horse was wearing Wellington boots because the spray was diluted sulfuric acid. The droplets would run off the smooth, shiny leaves of the crop, but remain on the furry leaves of many weeds, so killing them. computer in the farm office, mobile phones, a laptop in the farm truck, and 200 horsepower four-wheel drive tractors would have been beyond Mr. Heinard's imagination when he filmed his farm in the late 1930s. This big John Deere pulling a six-farrow plough is typical of the high horsepower tractors used by today's arable farmers. Unlike early Case and Fordson tractors, which were flat out at four miles an hour, these modern giants can have 40 forward gears or more and a top speed in excess of 20 miles an hour. Life is very different for the driver seated in the armchair comfort of an air-conditioned cab bristling with computerized electronic controls. His horseman walked at least 12 miles to plough an acre in a day, but this six furrow model can plough between two and three acres in an hour. Furrow width on modern multi-furrow ploughs can be mechanically or hydraulically adjusted, and each share cuts as much ground as both bodies on Mr. Heinard's two furrow Ransom's plough. The rubber-tracked Caterpillar Challenger with over 300 horses under the bonnet and a road speed close on 20 miles an hour comes from the same stable as Mr. Heinard's 26 horsepower crawler made 60 years ago. Power harrows have transformed seedbed preparation in recent years with a single pass usually enough to make a seedbed. This harrow, with a piggyback seed drill, enables farmers to sow cereal crops into ploughed land in a single pass. The high road speeds of today's tractors waste little time travelling from farm to field, and their spring suspension systems allow higher working speeds in the field. Modern weed control techniques for sugar beet include pre-emergent spraying, this is being done with a JCB fast track and sprayer with gull wing spray booms which unfold with the grace of a ballet dancer. Sugar beet were first grown in the 1930s and over the years they've become an important arable farm crop. Unlike the man seen riding on Mr. Heinard's horse drawn sprayer, this driver is protected from harmful spray chemicals. The machine is controlled from the cab and an onboard computer makes constant checks on its performance. Monogerm pelleted sugar beet seed and modern root drills which sow individual seeds at precise intervals have done away with the hand labour needed to chop out or single this spring-grown crop. The in-cab computer checks drill performance and warns the driver when the seed hoppers are nearly empty.
here we are outside the Cooper family farm in Suffolk. Let's go in out of this cold wind into the kitchen and meet Harold and Oliver and share their thoughts about the changes in farming and see how it's affected them. Well, I made it. Hello, Harold. Hello, George. How are you? Very yes, George. Hello. Yep. <coughs> Oliver, I wonder, can you tell us first a bit about what the farm's like today? Yes, I can, George. This is an all arable farm. We are all combinable crops. We have about 400 hectares, which in all money is just over a thousand acres. And the cornerstone of our production is wheat. We're a heavy land wheat farm. And we couple that with break crops, which will be linseed or peas or seed rape. And it's a very simple operation. How many workers have you got now? Today I have a part-time secretary and three full-time staff. That's quite a lot for these days, isn't it? I, uh, yes. We run other things alongside this farm. I have a skill base in my workshop which perhaps gives me um, uh, more opportunity for extra business than some farms, so yes. So you do some work for other people as well? We tend to do other original work, original production rather than subcontract fabrication and so on. So Harold, 1936-1939, huge changes in, in mostly mechanisation. Yeah. How did you used to get the crops into the ground? How did you get your seed beds and what time of year? Well, <coughs> we grew uh, three, four island peas which of course uh, were uh, early harvesting, so we had a little bit longer than we have nowadays. There wasn't quite the rush as there is nowadays. What, what was your trefoil for? Who was it the for? The trefoil was for seed. I think it was an export to France. We would have, for instance, 50 acres of trefoil, 50 acres of uh, peas, and those crops, the land could be ploughed early on in August or late July, as soon as the land was cleared. So we'd have time to work on that. We would uh, pretty well do the same as we do today. We would plough and then roll and then either disc or cultivate to break the soil down. But we didn't get the same amount of uh, fine tilth that we get today. The uh, You couldn't? Uh, well, we could. Th that is quite true. We couldn't. And mm. I don't know that we desired it always. We always said that rough land was good for wheat, fairly rough land, providing you could get a good plant. Uh, Oliver, would you go along with that now? Things have changed quite a lot now in that on this farm, for instance, on a thousand acres, I'm looking with one man and one tractor to plough and prepare all my seed beds and complete all my winter planting by my target date, which is October the 10th. That is a huge change. Yeah, my goodness. Yeah. What, what about if the weather isn't right? We have uh, probably better equipment today in that the caterpillar that you've seen with very wide tracks is, uh, although it is large, will be much lighter on the ground than some of the systems we were using 10 or 15 years ago. So A, you don't need so many days, and B, the soil hasn't got to be quite so dry. Correct. And the drill that you used in those days uh, what sort of feed? Was it pneumatic or did you have cup feed or what? No, it was, uh, an, Amer it was an, Amer an American type drill. It wasn't a cup feed, it was a, a barrel type, cylinder type feed. And uh, it was about 12 feet wide, I would think, which was quite big for those days. What do you use now? Today I'm using an 8 metre Vedastat drill, which is a cultivator seeder. It is a pneumatic system and it allows us to go into land that has been ploughed and rolled once and plant directly into that without the mid-operations that we've been used to doing with, say, power harrows and discs and rolls, that kind of thing. And I suppose it goes twice as fast. It's twice the width. Does it go twice as fast? It is capable of planting a lot of land in a short space of time. For us to drill 150 acres, say, in a day is, uh, you know, is not that difficult. The crying of lambs in the fields was the pleasantest sound of springtime. One of the border Leicester youths did well to produce triplets. Not to be outdone, another went one better with quads, all looking well. But as every shepherd knows, there are always a few orphans who have to be fostered. The hyena daughters were only too willing to oblige, as did the shepherd's old collie bitch, 
who'd lost her pups. No Kent farm could be without its apple orchard. A springtime job was to spray the trees to kill harmful insects. A single cylinder engine drove the pump to create pressure for spraying pyrethrum, a relatively harmless insecticide, or so one would hope for the sake of the horse. An important cash crop, well worth a lot of trouble, was the scarlet runner bean. It seems quite extraordinary that every individual seed had to be planted out by hand. Backbreaking work, but obviously economically viable. The horse was put to use for the slow work of marking out. Then came the massive task of stringing the poles, using a most wonderful device aptly described as a bean pole stringer. An essential tool with 12 miles of beans needing to be strung. While that was being done, the caterpillar tractor was on another field spreading superphosphate in preparation for planting seed potatoes. Crawler tractors were just becoming popular, but on stony ground, the metal tracks wore out very quickly as many farmers discovered to their cost. Once again, when a job had to be done fast, it was all hands, hooves and machines to the field. Like the beans, seed potatoes were planted out by hand. As this was such a mammoth task, local women were hired in as extra labour. As soon as a row was planted, the balks were then split, so covering the potatoes on either side within their new ridge. This was a job best done quickly, and therefore the tractor proved to be more efficient. But the horse still bettered his successor with this clever ridge roller. If used on a warm, dry day, newly emerged weeds were sufficiently disturbed by the little spikes to kill them. This crop of earlies had just started flowering, so it was time to spray against potato blight with copper sulphate. A treatment still in favour with a few old-fashioned gardeners today in the traditional Bordeaux mixture. Orchard sprayers have also changed beyond recognition. Protective clothing is required by law. And nozzles can be changed in an instant. In the 1930s, Mr. Heinard used a horse-drawn sprayer unit with an engine-driven pump and hand-held spray lances. But this machine, with its high-capacity fan, blasts the chemical into the trees the job is done in no time at all. There are more vineyards in Britain now than in pre-war days, and some of them will be sprayed with specialist machines, like this French sprayer, which straddles the rows. Top dressing cereal crops in the spring is vital for maximum yield. Modern technology makes it possible for the combine driver to record yield from all parts of a field at harvest time. This information can be used to match the next crop's fertilizer application to its potential yield. The in-cab computer linked to Earth-orbiting satellites plots the position of the tractor in the field and at the same time varies the application rate of the twin-spinning disk broadcaster as it progresses across the field. Air pressure from this sleeve boom sprayer forces the chemical down into the crop and the tram lines ensure the driver doesn't miss strips or apply a double dose. Field scale vegetables are usually grown on a bed system and sown with a precision drill. French beans are now grown instead of the previous labour intensive scarlet runner bean crop. 
Other large-scale vegetable crops grown on the farm include leeks and carrots, which are mechanically harvested and eventually appear on supermarket shelves. Harold, is the farm very different now from your days in 1939? Oh yes, it's very different than it was in 1939. But uh, a great change came in 1936. What happened then? Well, we, we uh, made a big leap forward in uh, the acquisition of a combine harvester as against the old system of farming, and we also purchased the Lands Bulldog diesel tractor. So 1936 was your big year for mechanisation? That's right. How big was the farm in those days? It was about 550 acres. Growing <coughs> the same sort of crops as now? Yes, growing the same sort of crops. Oliver, you've, you've just got this huge uh, crawler tractor. Is that the first one with rubber tracks that's been around here? No. The rubber track caterpillars came in about 12 years ago to this country from the States. This is a second generation one for me. This is Mark II, if you like. Of the rubber track? Yes. As the summer progressed, the early lambs were given a fattening feast of lucerne a rich, leafy stock feed, sometimes called by the American name of alfalfa. The shepherd had to be careful not to let them overdo it, or they'd get bloated. The annual dip to control sheep scab has not changed to this day, though hurling the ewes in upside down doesn't show much feeling. It was compulsory that every sheep in the land be dipped before a set date, hence that ever-watchful policeman. The next job was shearing the wool. At least they'd got past the hand-shearing stage, but not much further. This mechanical clipper, which is so modern at one end, still needed an enormous amount of muscle power to drive it at the other end, usually the boy's job. Until recent times, every farm in the land kept pigs. They cost little to feed, and the market was always keen for fresh young porkers. Mr. Heinert's piggery was modern and highly efficient, and most important, it gave him a good reason for an outing to film his local market. Market day has always been as much a social as a commercial occasion, and farmers could catch up on agricultural gossip. In those days, before radio and television farming programs, there was only one journal, so progress was a matter for discussion. It had once been traditional to keep plenty of free-range fowls, but now only the khaki Campbell's foster mother was allowed to wander at will. All the rest had gone modern in the warmth of the new rearing house at the back of the other farm building. There, a Gloucester Gleevum incubator was the mother of a hundred chicks at a sitting. The success rate of this method was constantly 95%, while at least half the free-range eggs used to be lost to rats and poor mothering. These were light Sussex pullets, just ready to be sold at market, not for killing, but as excellent laying stock. The argument as to who actually fathered such fine progeny raged long after the young ladies had left, while their real mothers got on with their work. Sheep are still dipped to control sheep fly and scab. But the shepherds on this farm, kitted out in protective clothing, have a gentler touch than they did in Mr. Heinard's day. And there's no longer any need for the village bobby to be in attendance.
Hand and mechanical spraying are alternative ways to overcome the problems of fly and scab. And these methods are preferred by many of today's sheep farmers. Shearing is still a busy time in the sheep year and a shearing machine driven by an electric motor makes this an easier task. Shepherds still rely on their dogs to help them move the sheep, but quad bikes have drastically reduced the distance they walk in a day while checking the flock. Sixty years have seen vast changes in the way pigs are kept. Stock running loose on the farm meadow were replaced by intensively housed pigs in the 1950s. There's nothing pigs like better than wallowing in mud on a hot day, and this farmer is making sure that his porkers can enjoy this luxury. The 1990s have seen many farmers return to the less expensive large-scale outdoor production systems where the pigs are allowed to roam at will. Indoor pigs, on the other hand, have food and water delivered to their pens. And although these little pigs lying comfortably in straw may not be able to wallow in mud, they'll be dry and warm when it's cold and wet outside. Mr. Heinard could only hatch a hundred eggs at a time in a paraffin heated incubator, but 60 years later, these little chicks were hatched in large, automatically controlled electric incubators holding hundreds of eggs. Cockerels were fattened free range in days past, but broiler production in large buildings is the only way farmers can meet the public's demand for chicken and chips from the high street takeaway shop. Harold, in your experience, do you think the weather has changed between now and back in the 30s? Uh, the weather appears to uh, uh, operate in a, in a 10 or 12 year cycle. So to answer your question is, is rather difficult. I've seen very, very wet, cold seasons. Nothing new now then? Not really anything new. Harold, I, I assume that you're retired by now. Yes. And that your son ha has taken over. That's right. Would you think that uh, he could enjoy his farming like you did? I, I think so, yes. He's very interested in all types of conservation, tree planting, putting some of the hedges back, which I removed, <laughs> and uh, I'm sure he gets quite a lot of enjoyment from that. Do you think he knows more about the wildlife and the plants and, and the environment than you did? Uh, I, in one way, yes. In, in the chemical and the insect, destroying insects and the, the vulnerability of uh, the, the dangers, rather, which uh, appertain to spraying and that sort of thing, yes, he's very interested and concerned about that. And you didn't actually realise that there was a problem? No, no, no. What about you, Oliver? Do you find, do you feel that you're very much inhibited by regulations and pressure groups? We're certainly controlled by a whole raft of regulations that were not there when I began my farming life. But farming is always going to be driven by people who enjoy it. You've got to enjoy it to do it. So I enjoy it, but the regulations are there and they increase in every aspect of life, not just farming. I'd like to ask you a bit more about the labour, the staff. These days, do you think staff have to work as hard as they did when uh, Harold was farming? I think we work longer hours today. We have lights on equipment. We tend to work weekends. And for certain operations, I can think of spraying one in particular where we are controlled by, again, a whole raft of regulations. We will go to all manner of trouble early in the morning, late at evening to comply with regulations. Not just the regulations, but because we have neighbours who are sensitive to how we farm. So I think we don't work harder physically, but we work 
longer hours at time and certainly under slightly more stressful situations, conditions. And do you find plenty to do for everybody? I do, yes. Even I in the winter? I think you have to be imaginative enough to find plenty for your staff to do because you cannot have good staff with idle hands. You seem to have got more staff than, than most people. Um, what are they doing in this snowy time? Well, modern farming uh, systems require quite sophisticated machines. Sophisticated machines require well-trained, motivated staff. Um, and once you've got that level of skill in your staff, you then have a skill base from which you, you, know, you can do all sorts of things. In my case, I have run an engineering business manufacturing out of that skill base from the premises that we have here. So you've got a warm workshop, have you? I have indeed, and it is much valued by those that work in it. <laughs> Although his field of Lucen had already been cut twice for hay, the third growth had a special value. It was bundled up by hand for direct delivery to London, where there were still working draft horses needing this very high protein nourishment. During a rare lull in activity, Mr. Heinard got all his men out to turn the hay, the healthy way. Once dry, it had to be stacked quickly in case of rain. The old hay sweep, once drawn by two outrigger horses, would have been far too slow, so they were replaced. And the stacker winch, once horse-drawn, was worked with a ransom garden tractor. A crop rarely seen today, but common because of the impending war, was flax. It was grown for its fibrous stems, which were so tough that it couldn't be cut, but had to be literally pulled out of the ground with a special machine. Two rubber belts gripped and yanked the plants out, roots and all, and then the harvester tied them into little sheaves ready for the factory. The crawler was quick to cultivate and discarrow yet another field in preparation for the cabbage and savoy plant, which had been sown with the hand drill in the spring. The young plants, which had been growing in a corner of the field, were dug up ready for transplanting. It was essential that their roots were not allowed to dry out in the hot sun. A water bowser was hauled to the field so that every single planting hole could get a cup full of drink. This was to be their final year of planting out cabbages with a dibber. At last, Mr. Heinard had bought one of the latest robot automatic planters, one with a bench so that everyone could ride in comfort as they fed the plants into metal fingers on an endless belt, which neatly pressed them into the ground below. But they soon discovered, though the work was done quicker and neater, it was boring beyond belief and left one stiff as a board. But that's progress. The scarlet runner beans had now grown to the top of the strings and were almost ready for picking. Throughout the summer, there had been regular weed control using a horse-drawn cultivator. Here again was another use for the horses, which had not yet been improved upon by any machine. But every aspect of bean growing was labor intensive, from the planting to the picking. Look just how carefully they were packed in paper. Lucerne was grown in the 30s for fodder, but this field is being cut by a contractor and then taken to a feed mill, where it's dried and processed into high-quality meal. Some lucerne is grown by farmers for their own use. The crop may either be made into silage or high-quality hay. Grass was mainly used for hay, 
and haymaking was a labour-intensive operation when Mr Heinard recorded it on film. Silage making became fashionable in the early 1950s. Within 20 years, the troublesome knife mower had been replaced by disc and drum mowers, which make quick work of cutting heavy grass swords. For really fast work, farmers can have a mower conditioner at both ends of the tractor. This outfit, on show at a grassland demonstration, has crop conditioners behind the cutting mechanisms. They bruise the grass stems to hasten wilting and prepare it for the next stage in the silage making process. This wilted crop is being collected by a forage harvester and blown into a self-emptying trailer. The loaded trailer is hauled to the clamp where it's consolidated and then covered to exclude air while the silage ferments. Many farmers now bale their wilted grass when making silage. This type of baler gathers the swath and makes round bales either held together with twine or wrapped in net. Air must be excluded from the bale to produce good silage, so the completed bales are mechanically wrapped with plastic and taken to the farmyard. Silage is a staple food for cattle in the winter months, and the heavy silage bales are taken to the yard with a forklift truck. With the plastic cover and net removed, Issuing the day's rations is now an easy job. Hay is still made on some farms and much of it sold to riding stables. The swath is lifted with a tedder to improve air circulation and dry the grass for baling. The scarlet runner beans grown in Kent in the 1930s and hand-picked for the London markets have long since been replaced by French beans sown with a precision drill and harvested by one of these huge self-propelled machines. The gathered crop is rushed to a quick freeze factory and eventually ends up in a supermarket freezer cabinet. Now I'll ask you both this question. Um, I'll start with Harold because that's fair. Where do you think farming has made the most progress during your lifetime? The, well, the most prog uh, progress has been made in, in an easier life for the farmer himself. Uh, I don't say less worry, but less physical work by the applications of all the wonderful machines that we have nowadays. The progress which has been made in my lifetime has been absolutely phenomenal. I don't think anyone could possibly have foreseen the way that agriculture has developed over the last 50, 60 years. Oliver, the, the progress in your lifetime and in Harold's, what would you say from your observation? Well, without a doubt, for, uh, in my farming lifetime, the biggest progress has been made through plant breeding, especially in cereals. Between 19... 75, say, in 1984, we doubled our wheat yields on this farm. And that came about mainly through the plant breeders, uh, also, to some extent, through our better understanding of what makes plants function, or more specifically, what makes plants ill. If a plant has got mildew, it isn't going to um, produce its maximum yield, if it's suffering from rust at all. So we became better farmers better understanders of, of the crops that we were growing. And then we began to dispense to them products that put those problems right, whether it was an insect problem or a fungal problem. And other limiting factors, soil structure and so on, also came into this holistic approach. You could say that science really arrived in farming, although it started, what, 150 years ago? Yes. It all came to fruition in the mid-70s, which was the result of decisions after the Second World War to invest in agriculture, plant breeding specifically. And we are now again right at the next potential big jump with genetically modified organisms. So we are now again at the beginning of another um, leap forward, albeit one that's being very hotly debated in the public domain. 
harvest time arrived. Using scythe, an entrance was cut into a field of oats to make room for the arrival of the reaper binder. It was the D2 which got the job of pulling it. Every man on the farm worked in the harvest field every day that the sun shone. Once again, there was work for the horse in the harvest field. And the men worked hard too, stooking the sheaves. Whatever methods had ever been used in any corn harvest, the pace is relentless. There is always the risk of a change in the weather. While some things cannot be hurried, others think they can, like the Alice Charmer B tractor. When we look at this scene now, it appears timeless and unchanging. Yet in 1939, progress was marching rapidly forward. It was the end of a wonderful era. Mr. Heiner knew he must be quick to record the old way of stacking corn sheaves. First, the stack base was carefully measured out and the four corners marked out with sticks. Then, a load of straw bundles saved from a previous threshing were brought to form the stack bottom. Although they would build up this straw to a height of three feet, it would all become compressed by the eventual weight above to form a damp-proof course. Every bit of the work was by human muscle power wielding two times pitchforks. Once the bottom was completed, a stoop was set up in the middle. The sheaves would then be laid round and round it. Those on the outside were placed ears inward, stems out, with a slight downward slope so that no rain could run into the stack. Its overall size was determined by the amount which could eventually be threshed in one day. There was only room for five men per stack, under the direction of their most senior member, called the stacker, or in some counties, the team man, or even the lord. When there was no more room to pitch, he worked in leather gloves to protect his hands. They all had to take great care not to fall off, it was not unknown for men to suffer dreadful injuries after slipping or losing their balance. At the start of the day, the work was fairly easy, but as the sun got hotter and the stack grew higher, so their muscles began to flag. Great skill was required to build a symmetrical corn stack, whether rectangular or round, something only learnt by many years of experience. Today, it's a lost craft. One has only to see a stackyard filled with the reapings of a good harvest to be filled with admiration for the workmanship of those men. But the most extraordinary care was taken with stacks which had to stand longest. They were thatched. Some good long straw was tossed, sorted out, and then wetted to help create friction. It was sorted into bundles called yells, which were a handy size for carrying up the ladder. The thatcher then cut his hazel pegs, known in East Anglia as broches. The first yells were laid along the bottom edge of the stack. Each subsequent layer would then overlap as he went up. Of course, the work was not as thorough as required for thatching a house, which would need to stand for many years. Nor was this man a professional thatcher. This was just another of the wide range of skills which farm labourers used to have. It was an enormous effort climbing up and down the ladder all day, especially for the older men who usually took on this task. The pegs were pushed into the straw to provide a key for the string. The yelves were held on by a sort of rough blanket stitch. 
The satisfaction gained by the thatcher more than repaid his effort, especially when neighbouring farmers came by just to admire his handiwork. Cereal crops need to be as dry as possible before they're combined, and this field of wheat will yield three tonnes of grain per acre, compared with a little more than a tonne an acre in the 1930s. The dozen or so men required for Mr Heinart's harvest have been reduced to just two, who, with a combined harvester and trailer to cart away the grain, complete the job in a few days. A computer in the cab can be programmed to prepare the combine for threshing different types of crop, and then monitor machine performance. It also records crop yield and field position on a smart card for later use. Back in the farm office, the information on the smart card is used to produce a yield map. The different colours show how yield varies across the field and the data provides valuable information for the latest precision farming systems. The big baler used at haymaking time to make very heavy bales of hay can also be used for the straw. Straw was valued for livestock bedding and was carefully stacked after threshing. Farmers who keep livestock these days usually bale their combine straw with a big round or square baler. In arable areas, much of it's chopped as it leaves the combine and is ploughed in. The big bales are tied with strong twine and a forklift truck makes loading and carting an easy job. And a tractor-mounted loader makes stacking the bales in the barn another simple task. But muscle power is still needed when bedding down yarded cattle. What are your outstanding memories? OK, you, you've got the introduction of complete change in mechanisation. Tell us about that. What was this first combine actually like? Well, it was a ve to us it seemed a very, very large machine as opposed to the old binder system that we'd been using up to that date. Most of the, uh, the benefits that we had from it uh, were a much easier life. It was such hard work, forking everything with sheaves and stooks and stacks and, and thrashing the machines, film, yes. all the dust and all the uh, work that had to go on before getting the machine ready and the grain, grain had to be carted in at night after we'd finished thrashing. We were, at that date, thrashing in the field, of course. Was it a, a bagger combine, so you had a driver on the combine and a bagger? No. Uh, it was a tanker machine, so that the grain was loose. So there was nobody on the machine? Yes. Or, well, apart one, from the one, one operator on the machine and one on the Lambs Bulldog tractor. So, which so it was trailed, it wasn't trailed. self propelled I drove the tractor at the front, and my eldest brother, John, was on the uh, top of the machine raising the platform up and down with a wheel, something like the wheel on a ship, which controlled the ship. So if you didn't get it right, it would dig in? That's right. Yeah. How wide was this toolbar? The 12 foot cut. 12 foot? And the largest other harvesting machine in the area was only about 6 foot, 6 to 7 foot. That was the old fashioned binder. So we were doing almost double. And you were thrashing at the same time? Thrashing at the same time. Was it one of those things that you had to treat with great care, you know, the moisture content wasn't quite right, it would jam up or anything? Uh, 
No, we we had we used common sense in the thing. We were used to we wanted it as dry as possible, so we would not often start till eleven o'clock in the morning to make sure that the grain was as dry as it was possible to get it under normal conditions. What about, I mean, it was a pretty new machine for those days. Was it reliable? Very, very reliable indeed. How did you come to get it in the first place? I mean, most of us wouldn't have heard of a combine in those days. Well, we'd always heard and discussed these, this system of farming, particularly after our cousins came from Canada and stayed with us a few days. In the event, where did you actually get it? I mean, how do you, I mean, it's an awful long way for a combine to come. Well, it was, but the, the Royal Show at Ipswich was the great, uh, it was a great show for us, and with the, that was the first time that we saw these big open-type prairie combines. There were three, I think, at the Royal Show. One was a caterpillar, a huge caterpillar machine, which was 16-foot cut, and that, these machines just fired our imagination. You know, we thought, well, if these machines will work somewhere all over the rest of the world, why, what are we doing here, farming like peasants? <laughs> what about the impact of that new combine when you brought it here? Did, did you have to make many alterations on the farm? We had to make a lot of the gateways larger. Oh, of course. Because although the machine could be packed up in about an hour and a half, even an hour and a half is too long in the harvest time, so we, you know, we were keyed up to really get on with the job quickly. So we extended our gateways all to 25 or 30 feet. Not all at once, but over the next year. The potato crop was ready for lifting. The balks were split with the same plough used when they were planted, pulled, of course, by horses. But tractors were used too, speed being the essence of the day. And look at those baskets. Today, they'd be treasured craft work. The advantage of using a horse for this job was that his top pace matched the rate that the pickers were working. Some of the crop was carted to a central clamp, or hail, for storage. Then, after a final clear-up of the horn, the gleanings, which were mostly very small, were gathered up, so nothing was wasted. They were then riddled at the side of the field. That riddle is virtually identical with those in use today, except for the power source. Men certainly were men in those days. When the grading was done, the spuds were sacked up, ready to go straight to London's hungry hordes. Watch how the older men used a short stick to help lift those hundredweight sacks. Clever, eh? With so much hard graft required for the potato harvest, everyone was relieved when it was over. In the little orchard, the apple crop was ripe for picking. British consumers knew only our own strains of apples then. Although today's apple growers have difficulty in a market overcrowded with foreign apples, even in 1939, Mr. Hine had found his orchard was uneconomic. And soon after this picking, the trees were grubbed out. Mr. Heinert's field of sweet corn was obviously rather experimental because the only strains available were not at all frost resistant, so it was only grown south of London. But it was a risk worth taking as it had considerable novelty value for London's gourmets. Furthermore, it would no longer be available from abroad. The nation was now at war with Germany. Don't worry, this isn't an alien machine from outer space, but a self-propelled potato harvester. Many hours were spent harvesting the potato crop on Mr. Heinard's farm, but a modern harvester takes most of the backache from this important autumn job. Many harvesters have a team of people riding on a sorting platform to remove clods and stones before the potatoes are side elevated into a trailer. But with some machines, the crop is sorted at the store. 
The days of hand riddling and clamping the potatoes in the field are thankfully well past, and with another trailer load at the store, the crop will be sorted and stored in bulk. Later in the year, the crop is taken from the store, weighed and loaded into a waiting lorry. Much of the sugar beet crop was harvested by hand until the 1950s. Since then, mechanical harvesting has developed from single row harvesters to huge six row self propelled machines bristling with automatic controls which top, lift, and clean the roots in one operation. Looking back, what would you like to bring back that you feel has gone from farming? That is a most difficult question. Uh, what I would like to see back would be a more communal life in a village where there could be, say, a half a dozen or perhaps a, do a dozen farmers, whereby in now in our village there's only two or three in each village. And that is a very sad state for the smaller villages. So the rural community has, has rather disappeared. Yeah. And could disappear more. Absolutely. What do you think, Oliver, you could do about that? I mean, do you have time to participate in village events? We do participate. Um, I'm not sure any one person is going to reverse this change. These changes are irreversible. Um, and following on from what Harold was saying, one thing that I regret losing is the... Uh, sense of value that the farming industry enjoyed within the whole community. We are an industry at the moment that's under a lot of criticism, debate, and it's very easy to feel you're working in an undervalued industry. It, uh, indeed, an industry that's not needed at all, almost at times. That's because people aren't hungry. Indeed, yes, indeed, that's yep. true. Mm. What would you hate to lose from what we've got today? I wouldn't like to use the comfort of operation, the safety that goes with the job. I wouldn't like to lose the uh, advances that we have made in production and understanding of plants. Rather sadly, all these changes, though, come about with a price. I wouldn't like to lose the isolation in which we live. Uh, there's so much rushing about today. You can't park your car here, there, or anywhere that it's so nice to live in the country and uh, be your own boss and walk, walk about. Personal space, that's the word. And funnily enough, arable farming, while it has made amazing changes in both our lifetimes, still offers the romantic uh, fulfilment that attached itself to farming then. We still have sunsets, we still have open air, we still have that basic enjoyment, whereas in, 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 in modern stock farming, one could argue that that's gone in this area. So an arable farmer still, go up, uh, still can go out on his space and feel all of that. Well, Oliver and Harold, thank you both very much indeed for a most interesting discussion. Thank you. Our pleasure, Will. Winter was approaching, so the cattle were brought into a stockyard made out of straw. It cost virtually nothing to build, the straw being surplus, and the sheep hurdles which held it upright not being needed elsewhere. By cutting the wind, it reduced heat loss, so maximizing the fattening potential of these Black Angus cattle. What is not explained is the presence of that albino calf. Could he be the black sheep of this family? Come springtime, the pen will be pulled down and used in the buildings as litter. Another risky crop was cauliflowers. They all mature at the same time and spoil quickly. The old strain, with its four-foot leaves, was very slow to cut. But the new dwarf variety was much quicker. They were grown for pickling in jars as piccalilli. It was easy work getting them off to the factory in London. Cabbages, on the other hand, were not so critical. They could stand in the field until the market was good, and then just as many or as few as necessary were sold. During the winter months, fresh vegetables were always welcome in the towns, but now the war was on, they had a special value. 
While farm work in the old days always appeared pleasantly romantic, handling wet cabbages in cold weather was thoroughly demoralizing. And when it snowed, it was desperately unpleasant. The men wore potato sacks to keep themselves warm, which was certainly not waterproof. But they kept at it. Muck carting was definitely preferable. The manure, freshly dug out of the stockhouses, might have been smelly, but it was also nice and warm. And at least one was on the move with a horse. Another sort of manure came by railway from London. One could say this was the vegetables returning to complete the cycle of life. Indeed, useful rooks and jackdaws were grateful for the sustenance that willing Londoners had provided them. But pigeons were always a menace, hungrily pecking into the hearts of the cabbages. while rabbits stripped bark from the trees. A purse net over their holes and a ferret to drive them out was the best way of dealing with the rabbit problem. What might have been called a final solution. But in those days before myxomatosis, their numbers multiplied so quickly that rabbit-proof fencing was also necessary wherever fields were bounded by woods. A winter job every farmhand enjoyed was cutting chestnut coppice for next year's bean poles. The high point of the agricultural year in everybody's memories of the old days was the arrival of the threshing machine. Corn stacks were opened and the sheaves forked into its voracious mouth. The snorting power of the traction engine which drove it enthralled everyone. Though the work was dirty, uncomfortable, and very hard, the romance of threshing corn will live forever. But however the work was done, or will be done in the future, the farmer's objective has always been the same, to grow a good crop to finance the next season. Mr. Heinard's men were unaware that they were now the stars of this unique film record, Mechanisation has taken the hard work from feeding yarded cattle. The ration is mixed with the aid of a forklift truck and a diet feeder wagon and then taken to the cattle yard. Some handwork may be needed with a fork, but this keeps the stockman warm on cold winter days. Once upon a time, cows were milked by hand. Machine milking in a cowhouse made life easier, but in this computerized age, the cows can milk themselves. The parlor is open 24 hours every day, and controlled food rations are provided while the cows are milked. Once inside the parlor, the udder is given a quick wash and brush up before a computer-controlled robot puts on the teat cups. Food consumed and the milk yield are recorded. Teat cup cluster is automatically removed when milking is finished. The gate opens, and as the cow leaves the parlour, the next one in the queue makes her way into the stall. Threshing is no longer a winter task, but there's machinery to maintain, hedges to cut and maybe some manure to spread. Nobody spreads heaps of manure with a fork anymore.
And in this mechanical age, high-speed flail hedge cutters mean they no longer cut hedges with a hook. And when it's really cold, there is no better place to be than in a warm farm workshop servicing and repairing tractors and machinery for the spring rush. Well, we've taken a good look at changes in farming over the past 60 years, but I wonder what's going to come next. Well, I'd like you to meet Peter Hollinshead, who's the technical editor of Farming News. Peter, welcome. And what's going to force the change in the next 60 years? Well, I suppose in a nutshell, George, survivability. Trade barriers are coming down globally, and that means there'll be greater competition. Uh, even closer to hand, we've got uh, enlargement of the EU, the European Union, and uh, Poland, for instance, has uh, tremendous potential to produce uh, agricultural goods. Um, you think, you see, things have changed since the war, post-war years, um, when it was put to the floor for production, uh, because basically there are hungry mouths to feed then. Um, you probably won't remember this, George, but I think it was uh, probably 54 before um, rationing of, of butter and uh, meat came off. And then, to be competitive, farmers have got to be efficient. And to be efficient, they've got to be able to take on new technology to lower unit costs. And really, it's that that's driving this change that we're going to see in, the, in due course. And do you think yields are just going to continue on upwards? Well, I can't really see why they shouldn't. Uh, after all, today's high performance is tomorrow's norm. Um, when I was a kid, um, they didn't talk of uh, wheat yields of 10 tonnes a hectare. Uh, 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 now they're commonplace. Nobody talked of um, milk yields of 8, 9, 10,000 litres. And yet we've got cows doing that all over the place, and even some doing twice that. So I recognise there will be some thresholds, physical thresholds to that continued production or that continued yield, but on the whole I think the thrust is onward. What about mechanisation? We've seen huge change already from the sickle to that enormous tractor. What next? Oh, inevitably uh, we've witnessed a change from manpower to machinery power over the, over the decades, and that, that will go on. Uh, and uh, people like me who've perhaps witnessed uh, or had to stook sheaves in a field or whole rows and rows of turnips will welcome that change. So what next? Well, we haven't got a driverless tractor yet, George, but we are into precision farming, which allows us via satellite to uh, determine our position in the field and apply fertilizers and herbicides accordingly. On the dairy side, uh, we're just seeing automatic milking machines coming in, and with the infinite variability in teat positioning on udders, and the fact that the udders themselves are probably moving about, who would ever have uh, guessed that uh, would automate that job? I certainly wouldn't. What about biotechnology? Where's that going to lead us? Oh, this is a tremendous potential. It's, it's absolutely mind-boggling what, what that will be able to do for us in future. Scientists are, uh, presently are working on stay green grasses, which will help lift the protein yield from, from grasses because the stocks of plants are protein dying. Um, they're also working on fixing nitrogen nodules onto wheat, which allows the wheat to take in the atmospheric nitrogen and produce the fertilizer. So there is pot tremendous potential there. Um, that's before we get onto the GMOs, which will genetically mo modified organisms, which will uh, be able to offer disease resistance, herbicide resistance, uh, aphid resistance. And on the cattle side, for instance, I mean, we've seen the change from the on-farm bull to AI, and we've all heard of the last six months of the de debate over cloning, etc., whereby cells from just one parent are used to generate the next generation. I'm bound to tell you, George, that with, with this in mind, uh, the future of the male looks a bit precarious. <laughs> but is this technological change just going to be able to go ahead unhindered? Oh, no, no, no. There's bound to be checks and balances. There inevitably will have to be. The, the, there's the concern for the animal welfare, for the environment, um, even for the social fabric of the industry itself. So, no, uh, it can't just go on unfettered. Uh, there, will be, there will be checks on it, and that will come through public reaction and politics politicians, uh, legislation, etc. But do you think anybody's going to want to farm? Is farming still going to be fun? <laughs> well, it depends what you mean by fun, George. It'll certainly be challenging. There's, there's no two ways about that. Um, farmers take a tremendous pride in producing top quality stock and crops. And given a, a fair crack of the whip, and I must stress that, um, 
I don't doubt for one minute that they will respond to the challenges which they'll find ahead in the next 50 or 60 years. So there you are. We've seen a huge amount of change in the past 60 years and from what we hear, there's more to come. But wasn't it always so? Didn't our parents and grandparents talk just the same way as we've been talking today? I suspect they did. One thing we do know is that people have got to eat and they've got to breathe clean air and they've got to drink clean water. And we in farming have got to continue farming without damaging the resource base on which we grow everything. And you can guarantee that tomorrow's farmers, like today's and yesterday's, will meet the tasks set for them. Because their work is going to become ever more important in an ever shrinking world. This is the story of the farmer's war effort, told through archive and contemporary film. Coping with rocketing productivity targets, together with serious labor and equipment shortages, not to mention the odd incendiary bomb, the farmer's war was fought on all fronts. Um, Characterful first-hand accounts, together with expert interpretation of archive film and photographs, create a unique and informative view of the countryside community in their finest hour. This video is brilliantly brought to life with the narration of Dad's Army star, Ian Lavender. Over 30 of the most exciting new tractors in action. Packed with brilliant images and up-to-date information, Stephen and Jonathan's wheel-spinning, mud-flinging adventures are a must for all tractor fans.